Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining me to uh, introduce you to the history of Newcastle Jail. So on the 26th of November, 1919, just over 100 years ago, Ambrose Quinn, the last man to be executed in Newcastle, was led to a platform hidden from the public within the walls of His Majesty's prison, Newcastle, and he was hanged by the executioner, John Ellis, at 9.15 a.m. Ambrose Quinn was the second man who was executed that morning. Um, a man named Ernest Bernard Scott, also aged 28, was hanged at the stroke of 8 a.m. Now, Quinn was a corporal in the Royal Air Force, and he suspected his wife had been unfaithful to him during his service. Scott also murdered a woman who he believed he had a romantic attachment to, um, and that crime was committed near Blythe. Both men died instantaneously after a seven-foot drop from the gallows, and both were buried in unmarked graves in the jail yard. And this was a custom that emerged uh, once executions were brought within the prison walls in the 1860s. So before this, all over Britain and Ireland, um, executions would be carried out uh, on public roads, in certain uh, districts uh, just outside the town walls. Um, but from the uh, 1860s, uh, they started to be brought, brought back towards the prison walls. Um, sometimes they're, um, the drops are um, off scaffolds built alongside the prison walls. But from the later 19th century, they're happening uh, within the jail yards in more hidden locations. So these were the last executions that happened in this place called Newcastle Jail in 1919, only over 100 years ago. And just a few years later, in 1925, the jail was demolished. Um, the, uh, the site was uh, raised to the ground and a telephone exchange was built um, instead. Uh, life and business in Carlyle Square and that district of Manors uh, and Manor Char in Newcastle went on. But the bodies of all of those executed men, uh, around 15 of them, uh, remained in the jail yard and they had to be removed once the jail was demolished. And in 1925, uh, a report in the newspapers indicated that the workmen uh, demolishing the site could only find 11 of these 15 bodies. Um, they also found an empty coffin, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. And this suggested that um, some of these bodies had been taken from the jail yard um, between around 1850 and 1910, judging by the bodies they found. And you know, in 1928, another report indicates that they found one more body, which suggests that 12 of the 15 were found. Um, and all of these bodies that were disinterred uh, were put in a car and driven to Old Saints Cemetery in Jesmond in great secrecy um, in the early, early hours of the morning in uh, October 1925 and um, were buried in unmarked graves in a section of the cemetery known as the Felons Plot. So for me, this story um, indicates, you know, it's it's kind of symbolizes the history of the jail in Newcastle. Uh, the jail is gone, but not quite gone. Many of you will uh, know that district of Newcastle, uh, Carlyle Square uh, and Manors, but perhaps maybe if you don't know the, the, the rich uh, history and heritage of that area, um, its deep associations with um, the civic history of Newcastle, uh, crime and punishment. And this story of the, the bodies kind of hanging around that area tells us a lot about how a city uh, tries to erase its past, tries to remove a certain layer of urban fabric, um, but it can't quite do it. And the past hangs around and heritage hangs around. Um, and, you know, we're not really able to bury the past, even in a district like Carlyle Square, which is now mostly associated with, you know, being what quite close to the motorway um, and um, um, having a, a sort of a mixed um, office use and student blocks uh, uh, today. So my interest in Newcastle Jail began when I was teaching a course in Newcastle University on uh, criminal punishment and especially um, the punishment meted out to murderers, um, post-mortem punishments like uh, dissection and hanging in chains. And in all of the sources we were encountering in that course, uh, the jail uh, was mentioned frequently in prison calendars, in uh, newspaper accounts, in judicial accounts, and in accounts of all of these people who were executed 
um, in, in Newcastle on the town moor or Westgate or in um, the jail site. And, um, you know, the jail was such a powerful presence in the primary sources. But when I wandered down to, to Carlyle Square, there's no indication that there was this um, uh, dramatic, uh, castellated uh, Victorian prison designed by uh, Newcastle's great architect, John Dobson. There was no indication at all. And that was quite a jarring um, 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 uh, difference that, that, I, that I encountered at the time. Um, and, you know, this district, I, I, I really like investigating this district because it was so important to the evolution of Newcastle. Um, the the Carlyle Square area housed uh, a workhouse, a house of correction. We've got a whole range of hospitals down there, the Holy Jesus Hospital and Davidson's Hospital, um, Blackett's Hospital. But we've also got the Barber Surgeons Hall. And the Barber Surgeons were connected to the jail in many ways. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, so, you know, today that area is, is, is more uh, known for, for its uh, motorway and, and office blocks and uh, the Warswick Street bus station, soon to be demolished, um, car parks, walkways in the sky. Um, so where is Newcastle Jail today? How can we try and recover the history of a place that hasn't left much tangible heritage um, how can we bring back to life an institution which saw, you know, upwards of 200,000 prisoners go through its um, um, gigantic gates? Um, what can we do when heritage is gone? So my talk tonight and some of the resources that are gathered around the jail are the first step in trying to um, um, bring back some sort of tangibility to this uh, story of the jail, to collect all we know about the jail, some nice images um, and, and, and memories and um, bring it back to life and thereby try and um, bring that district of Newcastle um, east of Pilgrim Street um, back into our conversations when we talk about heritage and, um, and the wonderful history of, of, of the, the city. So Newcastle has a, has a rich history in crime and heritage, of course, um, from the execution of the alleged witches um, on the town moor in 1650 to the train carriage murderer John Dickman in 1910. From the Castle Garth medieval dungeon uh, to the iconic um, uh, central police station and magistrate's court, buildings in Newcastle as well attest to this deep um, um, sense of heritage and history. Newcastle had three main gallows sites, uh, one on the town moor, um, just by the Turnpike Road heading uh, up Gallow Gate near uh, where, the, where the barracks was built in, in the later 19th century. Um, the other sites were um, the uh, Westgate, uh, near the town wall, and of course, Carlyle Square Jail. And all of these sites tell us stories about um, what was considered a liminal spot to execute a person. So uh, the town moor, of course, was just outside the town precincts, and uh, Westgate was a symbolic um, um, site because that was the end of Newcastle Town and the uh, domain of uh, Northumberland. So being a town, Newcastle didn't have any uh, anything like the level of executions that we see in, in, in larger um, places like, like London and Edinburgh. So there were quite rare events uh, in, in, in the town and that's why there's such important events in, in social memory in Newcastle. And this sense of, of remembering these notorious um, criminals who were executed, um, of, of criminal bodies being, being sent on strange journeys, this is all made concrete by a very important act in Parliament called the Murder Act of 1752. And this introduced into law um, a series of post-mortem punishments that could be meted out to people who had been convicted of murder. And the idea was that a judge um, could pass a sentence of um, the death penalty on a murderer, but furthermore, they could inflict what was called a peculiar mark of infamy and terror by sentencing them to post-mortem dissection. And um, most uh, murderers were sentenced to be sent to the surgeons, although some roughly um, 15 to 20% ended up being gibbeted, uh, which is also known as hanging in chains. 
And um, this, of course, brought the surgeons into direct um, a direct working relationship with the criminal justice system. So this might explain why, for generations, ordinary people in, in, in places like Newcastle and London um, were uh, deeply afraid of the surgeons. And they, they were afraid of what would happen to their body after death because of this perceived hunger among surgeons to dissect the bodies of um, the poor and um, vulnerable in society. And in Newcastle, the bodies were sent to uh, the barber surgeons at Manners, which is quite close to, to, um, to, to the jail. And uh, there would be a public dissection of some of these um, executed people in accordance with the law. Now, I have to say that several Irish feature in uh, the story of, of, of criminal um, execution um, and punishment in Newcastle. Um, so to go back to, to an earlier period, um, William Collins, a town moor highwayman, was hanged on the moor in 1784 for his crimes. James O'Neill was also executed there for highway robbery in 1816. But perhaps no death was as gruesome as that of Charles Smith, who was executed in um, 1817. And Smith was an Irish man who was uh, condemned to death for his role in the beating of a man in a newsburn uh, pottery um, and the man later died of his injuries. And as per the Murder Act, um, after hanging the usual amount of time on the town moor, uh, the body of Charles Smith was brought back to the barber surgeons uh, to be publicly dissected. However, the story doesn't quite end here because um, in 1818 it was reported that a local antiquarian had come into the possession of some of Smith's skin, um, which he used to bind a copy of the dead man's dying speech on the scaffold and this book is um, held today in the collection of the city library in newcastle and i think this is a really important uh, document if you will that um, invites us to think about uh, how civilized the society was in the 19th century and um, why uh, murders were treated like this after their death and for me this this inspires a conversation about you know, what is the difference between barbarism and, and civilization? Um, but it also brings into question um, the purpose of this. So we know that uh, serial killers sometimes engage in very odd collecting behaviors, um, collecting the body parts of their victims. But here we have an antiquarian in Newcastle um, taking a portion of a murder, uh, an executed person's skin, tanning it, uh, processing it into vellum, and then binding it in this uh, account. And, you know, this is quite strange behavior and um, um, it speaks to lots of questions around, around power, around curation, uh, and around how these criminal bodies could be further punishment, punished for generations after their death. Um, and indeed it's quite symbolic that, you know, a piece of Charles Smith is literally bound into his, um, his dying speech. So before I talk a bit more about the jail, uh, I'd like to go back a bit to the original uh, jail in Newcastle. And this was um, called Newgate. And Newgate was a medieval prison um, built over the northwest gate in uh, Newcastle. And it's just it was just built on top of Newcastle's old town walls, uh, roughly approximate to where uh, the shop next is today. They're just near uh, Newgate Street and it would have faced a moat originally where Barris Bridge crossed Pandendine and given the proximity of Newgate um, prison to the town's outer limits um, there were several escape attempts of course into the open fields beyond uh, Gallowgate and into the town moor and indeed in, in 1800 three prisoners did escape by making a hole in the chimney of their cell and they climbed to the uh, top of the lead roof and descended by a rope made from their bedclothes. And this is not the first time, it's not the last time, that um, prisoners escape from Newcastle jails using bedclothes tied together to make a rope. However, a fourth prisoner, who we're told was of a more cor corpulent build, uh, became stuck up the chimney and couldn't get down until he was assisted by the warders. 
Now, there, there had long been a concern among the town, town's authorities that Newgate wasn't fit for purpose. It was a school for criminals. And the key problem, it seemed, was that prisoners of all genders, ages and types of crime were mingling and um, communicating with each other. And this retarded any efforts at reform or learning. Um, one newspaper editorial in 1822 put it that, quote, the young and the simple depart from their cells initiated in all the artifice and trickery of accomplished villainy. And in many instances, the petty pickpocket soon returned to the scene of the crime um, in the more important character of a highwayman or a housebreaker. Now, at this point, you know, in the early 1820s, uh, across Britain, local authorities, magistrates, politicians and philosophers were increasingly concerned with reforming as well as punishing offenders. So there's a great reform movement um, and central to this was the idea of classifying prisoners according to their crime. And the idea was that you would physically separate men from women, debtors from criminal offenders, um, uh, boys from older prisoners, and um, separate serious offenders like murderers um, from um, more, more petty offenders. Inmates were supposed to sleep in single cells that were elevated in the building, and they were supposed to have minimal contact with other prisoners. In design terms, prisons were now being imagined as having a central set of buildings, a kind of a core observing building. Um, and then from this would be radial wings uh, that could be controlled and separated from the whole, if need be. And an extreme version of this design uh, philosophy was called the panopticon, which is a system of controlling institutions uh, controlled through surveillance. This was first developed by um, the great liberal theorist Jeremy Bentham. So after an act of parliament approved uh, a new jail for Newcastle in 1822, now was the time for Newcastle to try and build one of these modern, forward-looking, progressive jails that could you know, reform uh, many of the criminal offenders in Newcastle. And this building was in line with the town council's hyperactive activity in the 1820s and 1830s when they were bankrolling great um, architectural developments like Moot Hall and Lisa's Terrace and all of the great um, buildings that um, we now associate with Granger Town. So Newgate was demolished, the old medieval jail in Newcastle was demolished and the plans of John Dobson uh, were accepted um, by the jail committee. So in 1823, uh, Robert Bell laid uh, the foundation stone and some symbolic coins at the site of the jail and uh, thus began Newcastle's um, experiment in a progressive and reform-minded uh, criminal justice system. So since, since coming to Newcastle, I've found the area around Carlyle Square such an interesting district you know it's it's been heavily developed in the 20th century uh, the slums around the square were cleared in the 1930s um, and with the increase in car traffic in the mid 20th century and the arrival of the central motorway in 1973 uh, the area has totally changed it's like a burned over district and um, it's it's kind of off the beaten track for a lot of tourists and citizens in Newcastle and as I said before it's, it's really hard to get a grasp on how important it was in the evolution of the city and in, in even trying to get a sense of Newcastle's um, um, heritage. You know we can think about the ghostly emptiness of the Warswick Street bus station or even the strange cul-de-sacs where um, Carlyle Square meets the motorway you know Trafalgar Street and the, the railway arches um, Holy Jesus Hospital seems almost imprisoned underneath uh, bridges and overshadowed by, by, by car parks that almost seem to be in a kind of a perennial process of either decay or, or development. It's never quite clear which it is. Uh, nearby, uh, the jail just up against the town wall um, was once the site of the Barber Surgeon's Hall, a great 18th century building um, which survived until the 1840s. Um, and, um, you know, this was eventually bought out by the railways. And this, this brings me to one of the, the key things about this area, 
when Carlisle Square was picked to host a jail in the 1820s, it was one of the last remaining patches of ground that had been undeveloped in Newcastle. So there was a, a large kind of a green space called Carlisle Croft, um, which was within the town walls where people used to go for walks and um, have allotments and stuff. And by the 1820s, that district um, uh, around Carlyle Croft starts to be developed. So, you, you know, you've New Bridge Street is developed. You have the jail. You have the buildings uh, around Manors, um, Manors Police Station in the 1830s, 1840s. Then you've got more prestigious architecture coming off Pilgrim Street, uh, like the, um, the arcade. Um, but by the 1840s, uh, what hadn't been anticipated was the arrival of the railways. And Dobson, of course, is central to this again because um, Dobson is being brought in to design some of the railway infrastructure in Newcastle in the 1840s. So a big um, depot station is built near Manors. Then there's the Manors railway station. And then there needs to be a connection between North Shields and Central Station, which Dobson will, of course, design himself. And... The route for that connection from North Shields to Newcastle um, is through this district um, um, where the Holy Jesus Hospital is and the barber surgeons are. Now, it's a miracle Holy Jesus survived. and That building is still there today. But unfortunately, the barber surgeons hall um, had to be demolished in order to make room for the railway bridge. And um, they were taken out of that district and Dobson built them a new building uh, on Rye Hill. In, in the west side of the city um, near Victoria Street. And unfortunately that building is, um, although still standing, is in some state of decay. So on the other side of the jail, uh, closer to Pilgrim Street, we also have a very important little street called Bell's Court. And here in 1832, uh, John Fife, who later becomes the mayor of Newcastle, um, he's a surgeon and his, his family are well known um, in, in, as surgeons in, in, in the city. Fife and his colleagues open a um, medical school in one of these um, buildings and um, this attracts some uh, quite important young scholars including John Snow who will go on to uh, investigate um, very famously the causes of cholera um, in London in the 1850s. This medical school eventually becomes uh, what we call today Newcastle University over several iterations and several generations. But it all starts here in Bell's Court, um, just opposite the jail. Now, I'm most interested in the jail. You know, this is a very interesting area, but the jail is what I'm, what I'm here to talk uh, to you guys about. And the imprint of the jail is still there to see. If you wander down uh, uh, Worswick Street, uh, you'll be faced by Telephone House, um, this uh, large building uh, which um, sits exactly on the um, footprint of where the jail was. So if you wander down there yourselves and, and, and go around this, uh, this large building, you'll get a sense of the scale and presence of the jail um, in, in, in the city's history. Now today, uh, you know, once thousands, hundreds of thousands of prisoners went back and forth through the great gates of the jail, but today it is a mixed use um, site where you've got office 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 spaces, you've got a cafe, um, you've got um, a nightclub, yoga classes, a youth hostel, and um, at one stage I'm told there was a pole dancing academy in this site as well, um, which must have interested the uh, the ghosts of the many thousands of prisoners who once inhabited the same site. Now Dobson's plan for the jail involved the creation of a very imposing structure with a fortress style central tower, um, a formidable gate and door, and a prison containing 90 cells where each cell would look onto the back of another wing. Um, and Dobson went through many drafts of his plans and they're very, very beautiful and detailed and curated today by the Tynanware archives. And one of these plans involved uh, actually the, the, the erection of an execution site above the gate lodge uh, which wasn't um, um, built at the time. Uh, but I think Dobson here in the early 1820s is actually preempting the uh, removal of public scaffolds back towards the jail site. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, 
And you can see this in this illustration here. We've got a little drawing of um, Dobson's um, platform for executions, as he says. Now, Dobson went through several iterations of his plans, and he, he always used the best materials in his buildings, which might explain why it cost £35,000 in the end. And the cost of the jail was a constant source of worry to the uh, town council. Um, up until the 1860s, they're always complaining about the increasing costs of maintaining this jail. And Dobson didn't... Uh, didn't um, uh, use cheap materials in his constructions. But it's clear that he was very proud of this building. And, and we can see that in this beautiful painting here on the left, a watercolour, which is by Dobson himself, which gives you an indication of what entering the jail would have, would have looked like um, through the main gate. And then you'd approach this second internal gate operated here by a turnkey. Uh, and then you would go up uh, a grand staircase to reach this, this great central um, observation tower which is indicated here and again going back to that panoptican idea um, running off of this would be several wings that could be observed um, um, from the governor's rooms up here in the building and you can see here the an image of what the jail would have looked like if it was on a brownfield side of course and wasn't surrounded by increasing amounts of housing but you can get a sense of its kind of fortress and um, fortress style uh, uh, structure so Dobson's plan uh, was highly praised. Um, however, by um, unfortunately, only five of the six radial wings were ever built due to these costs. And this would have a this is an indication of the kind of problems the jail would face over time because there simply was never enough space for the amount of offenders who were being sent there. Um, so it was always overcrowded, um, and it always needed more um, more space for for offenders. So despite the money that was spent on this, despite the optimism and the great um, progressive intent, by the time proper inspections start in 1838, this jail is condemned as being unsuitable, as being damp, as being overcrowded and lacking in any real um, reforming ideology. So prisoners were not coming out of this um, either educated or reformed. In fact, recidivism was a major problem in the jail over time. Um, with repeat offenders coming back again and again and again. Um, prison reports indicate that the cells were very small and were cold or damp. Um, only a few rooms were heated by open fires. These were called day rooms. Um, already in 1838, there had been several attempts at escape and prisoners seemed to spend as much as 16 hours a day in their cells during the winter months, um, mostly doing monotonous um, monotonous work like um, teasing out oakum or if they got out into the yard they would be breaking stones um, or, or working on a treadmill so compounding these problems were the presence of debtors um, and debtors were incarcerated under different conditions than uh, general offenders debtors could have visitors um, for for up to three hours a day uh, but importantly debtors were also allowed to um, receive three pints of ale a day. And as might be imagined, these debtors then uh, sold on their, their alcohol uh, and any tobacco they smuggled in to the general population of the jail. Uh, it's only in 1840 that boys are separated from men. And the inspector noted that many of these boys were committed for petty thefts that were carried out on the quayside, usually the theft of old rope or old iron. And I think it's a big um, debating point in Newcastle around why so many offenders are, are coming through the jail gates. One idea is that Newcastle might be over-policed or that the police are oversensitive to public disorder and petty theft. And, you know, supporting this is, is evidence that shows Newcastle's borough police was really growing in size throughout this period in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. Um, and this was in response to a growing population. Uh, the other thing is that Newcastle didn't have just one police force because the River Tyne police was established in the mid-1840s. And these uh, officers as well were arresting young boys down at the quayside uh, who were stealing bits of 
um, materials and uh, um, um, building materials and industrial materials um, um, for 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 resale. So Newcastle is a manufacturing town. It's an industrial town. There's lots of factories around. Could this explain the amount of arrests that are happening, especially for petty theft? So that's kind of a, a broader issue that, that we can think about a bit more. So another interesting thing about Newcastle as a town is that it's attracting in lots of immigrants to work in the, the, the factories and the manufactories. Um, in 1846, uh, when the prison was uh, inspected on one day, there were 99 prisoners present. And of these 99, 14 were from Scotland and 19 were from Irish or from Ireland. And this really reflects the mixed roots of people in Newcastle. And of course, it doesn't include um, second generation Irish or Scots. So roughly a third of the prison population on a given day were not born in Newcastle. They were born in Scotland, or Ireland, which I think is quite interesting. And of course, most of these um, Irish especially were coming from the poorest district of Newcastle, um, Sandgate, where they have been flocking to cheaper housing, slum housing, um, since the Irish famine in the 1840s. So at, at, the, at the heart of the criminal justice um, system in the 19th century is, is poverty and lack of education. And there's some quite shocking statistics about um, the lack of education in uh, mid-19th century Newcastle. You know, thousands of children um, in Sandgate uh, had no literacy whatsoever and were outside of the education system. Um, and this lack of education extended to the jail itself where efforts to educate or reform uh, offenders um, uh, failed um, outright, it seems. So one letter from the jail chaplain, John Irwin, in 1858, really laid bare some of the long-term failings of the jail. Um, the jail was, said Irwin, a paradise of thieves. It was a nest of villainy. It was a hotbed of vice and a house of corruption. Irwin said that there was no proper heating, there was no proper lighting in the jail, there were no proper labour tasks, and prisoners could communicate with each other and between their cells in contravention of the rules. Prisoners could be found at all times huddled together, each corrupting the other. So for Irwin, the jail had become another new gate, another problem for the town. Um, and Irwin was concerned that there was no reformation possible in this jail. As he said, what right have we, because a young girl commits a brawl in the streets and is too poor to pay the fine, or she sells oranges on the footpath, or she steals her mistress's lace collar? What right have we to shut her up, bolted and barred and locked in day and night with the vilest, the most hardened, the most abandoned of her sex? Women from whose contact she would shrink with a shudder had she met them in the street. So what went wrong with this jail? What went wrong with Dobson's great designs? Clearly there is a um, increase in prison detentions that we can associate with the rise of a professional police force in the town. So the police are really established in the 1830s um, and um, they're arresting more offenders and judges are committing um, um, more offenders. Also, there's a gradual reduction in the use of transportation as a penal policy. So when you're not sending out uh, uh, low level offenders on um, uh, transportation ships, then you're sending them into the, the great prisons of the towns and cities of Britain. Another major issue is the, the presence of debtors. So debtors are packing out these jails um, and you know, debt legislation really isn't reformed until the later 1860s when um, a different system comes in and they're not constantly being imprisoned uh, alongside criminal offenders. But the fundamental issue of the jail is that it is built in a city centre, a city centre that is booming in terms of population, booming in terms of economy and booming in terms of poverty related crime and the relentless growth and development of the city around the jail walls. So, you know, one of the perennial problems in the jail is 
that people can simply toss over contraband uh, over these 25 foot high town walls into the uh, jail yards for the prisoners to pick up during their exercise. And it works both ways as well, because many prisoners uh, would toss out boulders and stones from their side of the jail onto Carlyle Square um, to indicate that they're ready to accept contrabands from their, um, from their friends. And reports in newspapers in the 1850s indicate that several people are being hit by these stones thrown over the jail walls and that windows are getting smashed all along Carlyle Square. The other thing to realise is that um, there's a great uh, fair, a great festival is being held in the shadow of the jail, and this is called Carlyle Fair. And this was held from about the late 1830s up until the later 19th century. And every summer, uh, thousands of people would gather uh, around Carlyle Square and all the streets running off it to um, trade crockery, to have fun, uh, to get pissed, to watch wild beast shows, um, to, um, to court, to meet each other, um, and to, um, to generally have a good time. And the prison governor was constantly complaining about the noise that this created, the disturbance it created for the prisoners, and the town council were concerned as well at the, um, the moral uh, uh, failings of this, this festival. So, you know, when you've got this massive public fair right in the vicinity of a jail, clearly this is not a long-term uh, realistic site um, to house and reform um, um, hundreds of uh, criminal offenders. So it's no surprise then that Dobson was employed again over 30 years after he was first um, asked to design the jail um, and he's employed to address some of the failings of the institution. So in 1859 the council fund Dobson's new plan to gradually pull down all of his wings and replace them with a single four-story rectangular block of cells against the back wall. And you can see that in this um, rather rare image of the jail from above. This is the great um, um, single block at the back, which would house the men. And this is the female wing. And the great central observatory remains with the, the governor's um, rooms and uh, the warders' rooms. And the governor would live here with his family, um, which, which indicates that, you know, several families lived on the um, jail campus. And here, of course, is the great gate, and all around is Carlyle Square. So uh, I'd like now to talk a bit about some of the most famous inmates of the jail, if I may. And one of the earliest inmates is um, a well-known uh, character called Jane Jameson. And Jane Jameson was a uh, fisherwoman who lived uh, in Sandgate. And on January the 2nd, 1829, uh, she visited her mother in her room in the Keel Men's Hospital, where after an argument probably fueled by alcohol, Jane stabbed her mother with a hot poker. And before she died, the mother told witnesses that it was Jane who did this, um, but she later retracted this uh, statement. Jameson was remanded in the newly built Newcastle Jail, and she was tried at the Guildhall in March she was found guilty and sentenced to death to be followed by public dissection. So two days later, because when someone is sentenced to death, things move very, very fast. Two days later, she is um, led on a cart, uh, sitting on her own coffin, to the town moor, where 20,000 people had assembled. She was dressed simply in a black dress, a black hat and a green shawl. Now, the execution of a woman in Newcastle was quite rare. And there hadn't been an execution since Charles Smith in 1817, some 12 years previously. So we can, we can imagine that this was an event which attracted a lot of commentary and a lot of viewers. So after prayers were said, the halter was placed around her neck and the cart moved away. And Jane Jameson seemed to die instantly. Uh, she hung for almost an hour before she was sent for dissection at Surgeon's Hall. And here, Dr. John Fife, uh, who I've mentioned before, um, lectured on the condition of Jameson's brain to an audience of around 50 medical men and invited guests. And these lectures went on for several days. And, you know, when somebody is being dissected in this manner 
for several days and by the end there isn't much that can be buried there's not much of a a, a coherent corpse uh, to bury and of course criminals will have known this when they were sentenced to dissection which um, brings that connection between surgeons and judges between doctors and executioners into light um, dissection was it was a punishment it was something that was carried out as a um, a mark of infamy as the murder act had it um, now for the surgeons they considered this part of their role in, in 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 civic society some of them would like to dissect people because it's good for education and there was a shortage of corpses and we know that many corpses were being stolen at the time from graveyards um, but it does show this deep connection between these sites of medicine and um, these sites of capital punishment. So uh, I'll turn to another case now, and that is the execution of Mark Sherwood in 1844. And he was convicted of the murder of his wife, Anne, and he's the last person to be executed on the town moor. Uh, Sherwood confessed to cutting his wife's throat after um, insulting and indecent gestures from her during a morning argument. And the Sherwoods were both illicit uh, distillers, whiskey distillers, who smuggled drink over the border uh, with Scotland and concealed it in the town moor before they sold it in the town. And on the day appointed in 1844, Sherwood was brought out of his cells uh, a few minutes before noon. He was accompanied by the chaplain of the jail and the sheriff of the town. And he stepped into a mourning coach, which was covered in black cloth and head off for the site of execution. So a little different than Jane Jameson's uh, journey. He was followed from behind by a hackney coach containing the executioner, who was described in the papers as an old man from Glasgow, but who we know as John Murdoch, who went on to complete his last hanging in 1851 at the ripe old age of 84, which is incredible. Uh, the cavalcade was protected by mounted police and it set up um, its, its, its procession from Cardiel Street up Northumberland Street before it reached the race course uh, on the town moor at around half twelve in the day. Large crowds, crowds estimated to be as large as 20,000, just like Jane Jameson, uh, gathered in the rain. Many men had come from the neighbouring villages and they'd brought their wives and kids as well. And after a period of prayer, Sherwood ascended to the platform, bowed to all and was offered the hood. Um, he refused the hood and he took up his position underneath the cross beam. He joined the chaplain in reciting the Lord's Prayer. The rope was placed around his neck and just as he closed the response, the drop fell and in a few seconds he ceased to exist. And as this was the last public execution on the town moor, this was the end of a centuries old tradition of visible, uh, ritualised and communal capital punishment where everyone would gather together to watch this event. From the mid 19th century onwards, um, the demands for reformation and the abolition of capital punishment gather force and the removal of the gallows from public sites to the jail site was the first step in this gradual shift in state policy that would eventually end capital punishment in the mid 20th century. Nevertheless, as was traditional on this occasion, a hastily printed broadside entitled uh, Mark Sherwood's Lamentation was circulated around Newcastle. And this put, you know, the remorseful and moralizing words into the dead man's mouth before he had even been hanged. So I'd now like to, to talk a little bit about some of the um, popular um, stories around the jail, uh, around some of the um, amazing escapes as well. So a newspaper reported in 1860 that the town of Newcastle has become known for two things. The impossibility of a thief for any great length of time to evade the lynx eye of the police and the incapacity of our prison officials to keep their prisoners in prison. And by the late 1850s, the jail was now overcrowded um, and underpoliced. It was surrounded by the railway infrastructure associated with manors, the busy streets off Pilgrim Street, and at least four public houses faced the stern walls of the jail. And this wonderful Ordnance Survey map 
indicates the busy nature of the Carlyle Square site. So we've got the Duke of Wellington public house uh, right here, which becomes a Wilder's pub, which many of you may know, recently demolished. The Duke of Northumberland public house, the George IV Tavern. Uh, we've also got a pub here and we've got the clergy Jub Jubilee School right here, just alongside the jail walls. So as I mentioned, um, Carlisle Square is a very, very busy district. Uh, moral campaigners target Eric Street, which is very nearby um, uh, Carlisle Square as um, a site of infernal vice. And it's known as Newcastle's red light district over this period where upwards of 200 prostitutes were told would gather and conduct their business in the shadow of the jail. As I mentioned, the Carlisle Square Fair was a major inconvenience for town officials and jail officials during this period. And add to this disruption was the fact that when Dobson was trying to rebuild the jail in the later 1850s, many of his, um, uh, many of his building materials were used uh, to try and escape from the same jail. So in uh, 1858, for instance, a garot robber named Robert Boyd, aged 22, escaped from his cell by using a chisel uh, to make a hole in the roof. Using a rope made from a combination of bed rugs, he lowered himself onto the galleries and gained access to the workyards. Uh, remarkably, there were, there were still long planks hanging around, even though there had been many escape attempts. And Boyd used one of these long planks to put up against the wall, which he managed to scale. And once he was on the top, he put some bags of teased oakum, so this kind of thick rope, over the spikes that were on the jail wall, and he used his rope to descend. And again, the jail walls are about 25 foot tall. Uh, Boyd managed to escape and, and was on the run for three weeks before he was recaptured. But several people who managed to get on top of the jail walls and descend actually broke their ankles uh, and, and injured themselves because of the drop. And of course, their bed ropes and their rugs were never quite long enough to get to the very bottom. Now, in 1859, a really interesting group of thieves, a gang, um, were nearing the end of a sentence and they managed to escape as well. And this is a, a nice story. Um, this involves um, uh, two criminals who were leading this gang with, with remarkable names. One is called Joseph Precious and the other was called Walter Scott Douglas. And they were daring jewellery thieves who preyed on businesses near Pilgrim Street and uh, the Royal Arcade. And they had apparently been trained as joiners and they were expert um, 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 thieves who could bore holes in locks um, and open secure doors using their professional tools. Douglas had been transported before and apparently he had learned some languages. Um, he once taunted a policeman with some papers written in Latin, apparently. And this gang managed to escape, probably using the same methods as their predecessors. Um, Precious was injured um, when he jumped from the, um, when he used his uh, rope to get down the uh, jail walls. Um, and he was later sentenced to 20 years. However, uh, Douglas was able to go on the run until April 1860, when he was arrested in a pub on the Scotswood Road in quite dramatic circumstances. So on this occasion, he was arrested by a, um, a, uh, a wonderful uh, detective named Inspector John Elliott, who was also known as Clencher Elliott, and Clencher went on to become the chief constable of Gateshead. And um, Elliot tracked down uh, Scott uh, Douglas to a pub in the Scotswood Road. And when he was apprehended, Douglas was found to have two loaded pistols in his jacket, as well as, well as a set of false whiskers and some stolen jewellery. As a newspaper reported, his appearance was fashionable in the extreme and a less experienced eye than that of our detective officers might have passed him for a highly respectable man. Douglas confessed that he was led into crime by his reading of the exploits of Jack Shepard while in prison and that his escapes were emulating his hero. So Douglas is brought back to Carlyle Square Jail, but guess what? After a few weeks, he has escaped yet again. 
And this time, Scott Douglas used the distraction caused by um, divine service on a Sunday to get out into the prison grounds where he built a scaffold using tables and benches and reached the top of the eastern wall. And it was believed that he then used a pole that was left by masons working on the Dobson designs and um, to fix it against the Jubilee school opposite. And he then descended from this using a bed rope. Uh, we're told that the mistress of the church jubilee school on the opposite side of the lane saw him descending in this manner called out to him to which he replied with an oath and douglas made for new bridge street and pandandine and escaped the clutches of the police once more however douglas seemed to enjoy the chase and he had a habit of writing poison pen letters to the police and his victims and a few days after his escape, he sent one such letter to the deputy governor of the jail, in which he expressed a determination never to return to Newcastle again, adding a hope that the prison officers would not be blamed for his escape. He also hinted that he had a small account to settle with one of the detectives for which he was prepared at any time. And this was clearly a challenge directed at Elliot, um, who once again tracked uh, Scott Douglas down in 1861 to Whitechapel in London where he was arrested for burglary um, and uh, when Elliot travelled down to London uh, to find um, uh, Scott Douglas Douglas is supposed to have said ah Mr Elliot I suppose you have come to prove my conviction how are you so despite finding Douglas uh, Elliot was unable to bring him back to Newcastle because um, while he was imprisoned in Colbath Fields Hospital, uh, Colbath Fields Prison, uh, unfortunately, Scott Douglas had stabbed a prison warder with a iron spoon that had been sharpened. So the celebrated jailbreaker and Newcastle's Jack Shepherd didn't end up in Newcastle Jail, unfortunately. So when, when researching the history of the jail, it's hard to avoid the fact that most primary sources come from one side only, from magistrates, from judges and journalists and uh, police records. But there are some prison rec you know, perspectives out there, and one of them was written by an inmate in 1879. And this gives us an insight into what life was like on the inside. And this inmate described in his account being sentenced to six months hard labour, um, and how he was led in handcuffs from Pilgrim Street Police Court to the short distance to the jail with the other prisoners. And he says a sympathising mob followed them, chiefly composed of small boys, unbonneted women and roughs from that odoriferous locality, the Stockbridge. Once the massive uh, door of the jail um, was passed, the new arrivals would enter into a reception room where they stripped and had a brief bath. They were then introduced to the rules of the jail, which were strict silence, no communication with other prisoners, no bartering of provisions, and the um, instruction to work hard. The men were examined for distinguishing marks. Some were, um, were, were, were given mugshots and their particulars were written down in files. And uh, they were then given their prison clothing, which is described as a jacket, a waistcoat, undergarments, stockings, and dirty brown trousers, which seemed to be half corduroy and half canvas. These had a yellow and white stripe running down them and were monogrammed NG for um, Newcastle Jail. So by this stage, the cells were uh, 14 foot by 10 foot and had a plank bed with three rugs. There was a wash basin, there was a table, a stool, a tap with cold water and a bell for the warder. The day began at 5.45am with a wake-up call and breakfast served on a tin pannikin slid through the door. At 6am the prisoner was given his day's work, which was four pounds of oakum to be teased out. And this was a tedious and monotonous job for prisoners. If the inmate managed to complete his day's work, he was liable for a slightly better diet and a promotion to a hammock bed, which was uh, the preferred way to sleep. This uh, oakum teasing was hard labour and it will continue with some short interruptions until 7.30pm every day, Monday to Friday. On Saturday, the prisoner would clean his cell, clean himself 
and they'd be giving a change of undergarments. Uh, church services or chapel services on a Sunday were one way to surreptitiously communicate with the other prisoners and um, they were given some activity in the exercise yards as well. Uh, shaving, we're told, was abolished by the 1870s, although some men managed to shave with sharpened knives. Tobacco, or as it was called, snout, was the great want in the jail, and all newcomers were hassled for, um, for, for tobacco. Talking between cells was possible if you bored holes using the wire rim of your dinner tin, uh, because one was only allowed one visitor every three months, so it could get quite boring. And we've got some really good sources um, for this period, especially the coll collection of mugshots that are um, curated by the Tyne and Weir um, archives. And um, these are online as well and um, available for people to explore. The first thing they do is they, they show you um, how aged many of these um, um, committal uh, prisoners were. Um, this man on, on the left is, is 51 years old and is sentenced to 12 months for stealing oats. Um, the other thing the mugshots show is the sheer number of, of children and minors who are being sent to um, a serious prison for, um, for what we might consider today to be petty offences. So uh, to give you just a brief um, insight into the, um, the makeup of the prisoner population, um, you know, most the typical prisoner, we might say, is a uh, young male labourer who is from um, Newcastle or Northumberland. And I think one of the interesting things is that, you know, compared to today, um, the employment rate was really high in Newcastle at the time. And a lot of the prisoners coming through the gates had trades and had skills. Um, most of them are, are put down as labourers, but there's very few who are put down as having no occupation at all. So the majority occupation is labour, and of course the majority crime is various forms of theft, um, theft from the person, larceny, um, theft of, of materials and uh, property. And um, the more serious sentences are given for um, theft associated with violence, uh, with sexual crimes and with uh, serial, serious assaults. Murders are um, quite rare. And as I said, there's not that many people executed in Newcastle over, over the 19th century period. As I say, the majority of offenders are quite young, aged between 16 and 25, but there are a significant number of children in jail um, in Newcastle during this period, some as young as eight or nine. Um, there's lots more work to be done on the, um, the makeup of uh, the jail population. Um, there's some indications that uh, jail authorities considered um, many of their female uh, prisoners to be active prostitutes. Um, this is what they're putting down uh, on some of their forms, um, although this is, this is uh, open to further investigation. Um, so I've, I've really only scratched the surface of um, what I can tell you about the jail uh, tonight. Um, and I'm delighted to say that this week we've launched a new website that can um, enrich our knowledge of the jail. And this website is called Newcastle Jail and it can be found at uh, www.newcastlejail.co.uk or .com. And, um, you know, I've only scratched the surface, but if you, if you, I encourage you to, to go to this a web resource where you'll find some really, really fascinating essays on different aspects of the jail's history. So, for instance, um, we have the story of the suffragettes who were imprisoned in the jail in 1909. And this is written by um, Megan Adams, who uh, was once a, a student of mine at Newcastle University. She's a history graduate and she wrote some fantastic essays on uh, the suffragettes in the jail who are imprisoned there um, for, for minor offences. They're protesting the arrival of David Lloyd George to speak at Haymarket. And um, they're, they're banged up in the jail for um, several weeks. And many of them are, are force fed and um, go through uh, quite traumatic experiences. We also have 
stories of the Germans interned in the jail at the outbreak of the war in 1914. And this is quite a sad story because many of the Germans working in um, Newcastle would have worked in engineering firms or chemical firms or in um, um, in sensitive sectors like naval architecture. And many of them are rounded up and are named as spies by MI5, despite the lack of evidence. Um, and one of them ends up in the jail, uh, a resident of Jesmond called Johann Jürgen Kerr. And um, his story is told in the website. We've also got stories of Carlyle Fair and the story of the barber surgeons and what the connection between the barber surgeons and the jail was. Um, the, the website itself has been designed by a really wonderful web designer called uh, Dr. Patrick Lowe. Um, Patrick um, is a PhD graduate from um, Sunderland University and has contributed many of the research essays to the uh, website. But he's designed a really, really beautiful website that um, I hope you will uh, enjoy. And I'd like to point out uh, a section of the website called Memories. And this is really exciting for us because um, I'm only a new arrival to Newcastle, um, but um, so many people have got in touch with uh, their memories of the Carlyle Square area, but also their connection to the jail and to crime and punishment in Newcastle. And in this section of the website, we're hosting some of those memories that were sent to us. Um, and one of the great um, uh, resources we have on this website is the letters, the prison letters of Ernest Bernard Scott. And Scott was the um, second last man to be hanged in Newcastle jail in 1919. And a descendant of Scott's has got in touch um, with us and has allowed us um, to, to, to publish for the first time the last letters of um, this murderer um, written from his jail cell in Newcastle. And this gives you a great indication into the state of mind of a person who is um, on death row um, and who has um, um, got lots of details about his crime and his obsessive um, 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 relationship with his victim. So I'd like to end by mentioning uh, uh, these sources, um, but also uh, mention some next steps in the project. Um, outside of the holdings in the local archives and local libraries, a few signs of the jail's existence um, survive today. However, yet again, the East Pilgrim Street district has been identified as a space for massive regeneration and investment over the next 10 years or so. And I think a cultural or a heritage component of this um, redevelopment is really, really important. Um, as I mentioned, this is a burned over district that is very much a layered part of Newcastle's history. And we shouldn't forget the important role that many of the institutions in East Pilgrim Street um, served for the evolution of the city. The lying in hospital, the barber surgeons, and the house of corrections, the workhouse, the poorhouse, the soup kitchen, and the manors police station and courts. So I want to enlist your help in gathering together some of the histories and the stories and the memories of the East Pilgrim Street area, because this is going to be transformed once again um, with, with new forms of housing and new uh, business premises. And I think it's really important that visitors to the area get a sense of the past, a sense of the rich heritage of this uh, district. And it's not just a place you know, associated with, with the motorway or with the car parks, but it's a place associated with, with history and culture. So the next steps are um, to continue with uh, updating the website, adding more resources, and um, hopefully um, um, getting some feedback uh, from yourselves. Uh, but also I hope to host an exhibition on the jail um, in 2022, um, um, timetable pending, and um, to gather again more, more um, stories and knowledge about the jail uh, and hopefully present it to the public in a more um, um, physical and tangible way than we've been able to do uh, tonight. But um, thank you for your attention and um, uh, thanks for listening.